A reading from Mark Twain, also known as Samuel L. Clemens, Roughing It, written in Chicago in 1872. It was in the Sacramento Valley that a deal of the most lucrative of the early gold mining was done, and you may still see in places its grassy slopes and levels torn and guttered and disfigured by the avaricious spoilers of fifteen and twenty years ago. You may see such disfigurements far and wide over California, and in some such places where only meadows and forests are visible not a living creature, not a house, no stick or stone or remnant of a ruin, and not a sound, not even a whisper to disturb this Sabbath stillness, you will find it hard to believe that there stood at one time a fiercely flourishing little city of two thousand or three thousand souls, with its newspaper, fire company, brass band, volunteer militia, bank, hotels, noisy Fourth of July processions and speeches, gambling hells crammed with tobacco smoke, profanity, and rough-bearded men of all nations and colors, with tables heaped with gold dust sufficient for the revenues of a German principality, streets crowded and rife with business, town lots with four hundred dollars a front foot, labor, laughter, music, dancing, swearing, fighting, shooting, stabbing a bloody inquest and a man for breakfast every morning, everything that delights and adorns existence, all the appointments and appurtenances of a thriving and prosperous and promising young city. And now, nothing is left of it all but a lifeless, homeless solitude. The men are gone, the houses have vanished, even the name of the place is forgotten. In no other land, in modern times, have towns so absolutely died and disappeared as in the old milling regions of California. It was a driving, vigorous, restless population in those days. It was a curious population. It was the only population of the kind that the world has ever seen gathered together, and it is not likely that the world will ever see its likes again. For observe, it was an assemblage of 200,000 young men, not simpering, dainty, kid-gloved weaklings, but stalwart, muscular, dauntless young braves, brimful of push and energy, and royally endowed with every attribute that goes to make up a peerless and magnificent manhood, the very pick and choice of the world's glorious ones. No women, no children, no gray and stooping veterans, none but erect, bright-eyed, quick-moving, strong-handed young giants, the strangest population, the finest population, the most gallant host that ever trooped down the startled solitudes of an unpeopled land. And where are they now, scattered to the ends of the earth, or prematurely aged and decrepit, or shot or stabbed in street affrays, or dead of disappointed hopes and broken hearts, all gone, or nearly all, victims devoted upon the altar of the golden calf, the noblest holocaust that ever wafted its sacrificial incense heavenward. It is pitiful to think upon. It was a splendid population, for all the slow, sleepy, sluggish brain sloths stayed at home you never find that sort of people among pioneers. You cannot build pioneers out of that sort of material. It was that population that gave to California a name for getting up astounding enterprises and rushing them through with a magnificent dash and daring and a recklessness of cost or consequences which she bears unto this day. And when she projects a new surprise, the grave world smiles as usual and says, well, that is California all over. But they were rough in those times. They fairly reveled in gold, whiskey, fights, and fandangos, and were unspeakably happy. The honest miner raked from a hundred to a thousand dollars out of his claim a day, and what with the gambling dens and the other entertainments. He hadn't a cent the next morning if he had any sort of luck. They cooked their own bacon and beans, sewed on their own buttons, washed their own shirts, blue woolen ones, and if a man wanted a fight on his hands without any annoying delay, all he had to do was to appear in public in a white shirt or a stovepipe hat, and he would be accommodated. For those people hated aristocrats. They had a particular and malignant animosity towards what they called a biled shirt. It was a wild, 
free, disorderly, grotesque society, men only swarming hosts of stalwart men, nothing juvenile, nothing feminine, visible anywhere. In those days, miners would flock in crowds to catch a glimpse of that rare and blessed spectacle, a woman. Old inhabitants tell how, in a certain camp, the news went abroad early in the morning that a woman was come. They had seen a calico dress hanging out of a wagon down at the camping ground, sign of immigrants from over the Great Plains. Everybody went down there, and a shout went up when an actual bona fide dress was discovered fluttering in the wind. The male immigrant was visible. The miners said, Fetch her out, he said. It is my wife, gentlemen. She is sick, and we have been robbed of money, provisions, everything by the Indians. We want to rest. Fetch her out. We've got to see her. But, gentlemen, the poor thing, she, fetch her out. He fetched her out, and they swung their hats and sent up three rousing cheers and a tiger. And they crowded around and gazed at her and touched her dress and listened to her voice with the look of men who listened to a memory rather than a present reality. And then they collected $2,500 in gold and gave it to the men, and swung their hats again and gave three more cheers, and went home satisfied. Once I dined in San Francisco with the family of a pioneer, and talked with his daughter, a young lady whose first experience in San Francisco was an adventure. Though she herself did not remember it, as she was only two or three years old at the time. Her father said that, after landing the ship, they were walking up the street, a servant leading the party with the little girl in her arms, and presently a huge miner, bearded, belted, spurred, and bristling with deadly weapons, just down from a long campaign in the mountains, evidently, barred the way, stopped the servant, and stood gazing with a face all alive with gratification and astonishment. Then he said reverently, Well, if it ain't a child! And then he snatched a little leather sack out of his pocket and said to the servant, There's a hundred and fifty dollars in dust there, and I'll give it to you if you let me kiss the child. That anecdote is true. But see how things change? Sitting at that dinner table, listening to that anecdote, if I had offered double the money for the privilege of kissing the same child, I would have been refused. Seventeen added years have far more than doubled the price. Interpreting this reading about roughing it from Mark Twain, I think that it's really about the change in society over time and how at one point there's a, a tough kind of brutish group of people who who would go out and risk their lives for the, the dreams that they had and then even 17 years later that dream seemed to have changed and things had settled down and you didn't have that same goal of, of going out and risking your life to, to gain a goal. And I also see quotes from people like Teddy Roosevelt who thought of Mark Twain as one of the favorite interpreters of the American West and he used this excerpt in some of his speeches when he talked about the uh, magnificent and glorious giants who tamed the American frontier. And with that, if I translate it into reading and writing and, and the advancement of the English language, I think it's the same type of uh, history where at one point people start developing the language and uh, their their goals are to uh, gain support and, and make a significant development in speech. And I think if you look over history and you see the English language, it's made the greatest impact around the world. It, it's become almost a global language uh, around the world. And so that pioneering of English uh, caused the movement that created what is the closest thing that we have to a global language. And so I reflect on a reading like this, and I think that there's something to it to say history, even if it's speaking of a man changing into uh, maybe less of a uh, brutish and tough and very uh, rough pioneer into a developed, uh, very refined 
person i think the same goes for the language and especially the english language i think it was a rough language that turned into a, a very refined and now a global language that everyone recognizes and most countries in the developed world uh, and in developing countries have to learn english in order to make it economically so that's my interpretation with what i've read